afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to join us and using, uh, giving up your uh, very precious time uh, after school, probably for most of you at four o'clock on what, what here is a very rainy day. Um, so just a quick uh, introduction then. I'm Becky Brown, so I'm one of the maths product owners at Twinkle. Lisa Tunnicliffe is also in the call. She is another maths product owner at Twinkle as well. Um, just to give you a little bit of background for me, on, on me, so you know that I, I know what I'm talking about. Uh, I was a primary school teacher for 19 years, uh, and during that time I was had responsibility for maths. Um, I was a couple of schools, one, one form entry, small school, and one five form entry, a much bigger school. So two quite different settings there. Um, and I also managed Key Stage 2 in that time. Uh, when I'd been teaching for about 14 years, I was lucky enough to participate in a mastery research group with the Maths Hub. If you have done that, you will know how, how useful it is. And if not, I can I can fully recommend anything that the hubs offer um, for mastery teaching is really worth going along to. Um, and I've also delivered CPD following that to um, my school and also other schools as well. So I've been at Twinkle now for just about two years. Um, and this is my second mastery teach me. So if you, you you may have come to the other one, we'll talk about it a little bit later. I've tried not to do too much repetitioning. Um, I'm thinking probably some people might have come to both, um, but we will touch a little bit on some of the basics that we talked about last time. So today's session then, so it does have a mastery focus and following feedback from last session, I focus a little bit more specifically this time on talking about how we can make sure that we provide, um, that we meet the needs of all of the children in our class. Um, and I've used some terminology which I'm not 100% happy with, but I'm just going to talk through it quickly. So I will talk about how when you're teaching a whole class and I have used on this slide the the word ability. I try will try to avoid that as much as possible, um, mainly because thinking about preconceived maths ability can be quite detrimental to to um, progress in maths for all children. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, however, I think lots of teachers and lots of settings still use the term for mixed ability groupings for a whole class. So I have used it, so it's really clear that you mean I'm talking about a normal whole class. Now, I will just put in there, obviously this is a very general session. I can't tailor it towards your setting or your year group. So I've tried to be very generic as much as I can, things that can be, um, adapted for your particular setting now that does mean when i'm talking about whole class i'm talking about a class of children who are working towards or at or beyond age-related expectations what i won't do in this session is talk specifically about those children who might have additional needs which means they can't access the curriculum at their age-related expectation the presumption being, and I realise that this is a this is a high order and not necessarily the case, but the presumption being that they will have an individual education plan and therefore will be um, working on an adapted maths curriculum. So it's, that's we won't be talking about those children who are not working on the same curriculum in this session, but we are talking about a wide range of children and we're talking about um, meeting all their needs, regardless of what their preconceived maths ability might be. So uh, I'm trying to avoid ability. I think in maths, often the children that you think that you might have previously labelled as higher ability are those children who maybe grasp concepts more quickly. So I might use the term for rapid graspers or slower graspers. They might be children with very good memory. They might have a really good um, working knowledge of maths. They could be lots. There could be lots of things that feed into how a child can access a maths lesson. So we're going to talk about what those could be as well. We could be thinking about children with a range of communication skills, a range of collaboration skills, a range of resilience and so on. So let's get on with it then. So just a, this is just a quick overview of why we teach for mastery and what it is. As I said, if you didn't attend the previous teaching for maths mastery teach me, there's a link there for you. Um, and that goes into a bit more detail about the um, pedagogy behind mastery, where it came from, what it looks like. But I've just put this in here. I'm not going to read it to you, but this is the bit of the national curriculum for maths in England that talks about the mastery approach. Doesn't use the term mastery, which means sometimes people can be a bit confused as to where it's come from. But this is what sums it up, really. It's about children being at broadly the same pace. It's about making sure uh, understanding is secure before moving on. It's about challenging and consolidating. So really, mastery is about assuming that everybody can succeed at maths 
and uh, putting things in place to make sure they do. And that can be very, very strong. You know, a whole maths ethos in your classroom is really important. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So I tried to use an analogy just to make it a bit clearer what I'm talking about, because a mastery classroom might look a little bit different. I have to make an assumption about you will all be using different schemes of work. You might have different size classes. Um, the arrangement of your class might be slightly different, but I'm going to use a, an obstacle course model for you so that we all are coming from it the same page. So what we are doing is we're thinking, OK, we've got a brand new maths concept, brand new to us and our teaching in this classroom. Uh, we're going to look at it as an obstacle course. So the obstacles in that course uh, are going to start really entry level. Pretty much anybody can access this. It's not scary. Everyone's going to get over it. It's great. And then gradually, the obstacles are going to get a tiny bit harder each time. So that by the end of the obstacle course, the maths you're doing can actually be quite complex, but you might not even notice that because you've had those tiny little tweaks. And that's uh, built into task design, which is one of the things we'll talk about a bit later. So the idea is then that we're faced with an obstacle course. And instead of just saying, OK, um, I think you're going to start at the beginning of the obstacle course. You can miss out the first three obstacles. You can go to the end. We're not going to make any assumptions. It's really hard to understand, particularly at primary, when we may be just trying to get children to a certain standard, how important understanding is. And being able to do something one way doesn't necessarily show deeper understanding. So it's really important that everybody is starting at the same point. Now, that does mean that the pace of your lesson is going to have to be quite carefully planned because you don't want to for children to become bored and lose engagement. And we'll talk about how you can do that. Um, but the idea is that everybody is coming at it together. The exit points might be a little bit different for certain children but we're coming at it together. And you'll want to start by, maybe you will start by showing the children how it's done. You might show them how to get over the first obstacle, or you might show them how not to get over the first obstacle, which opens up some discussion. So you're gonna do a little bit of, of modeling, whether that's modeling what a good one looks like or where you could make mistakes is fine. And then you're gonna give the children time to explore. And you're gonna do that in a whole class setting. So you're gonna mix your children and you're gonna expect them to work together. It's safe. Nobody is going to mark what they've done, hopefully. Uh, there's gonna be lots and lots of discussion. They're gonna work collaboratively and we'll, we'll come on to the next slide in a second about ways to do that. Uh, and we're going to make sure that everyone is in it together. Uh, we're not leaving anybody behind. We're going together, we're gonna to try this out. And of course, during that time, you're going to have to do different things to make sure that children are extended and supported. But ultimately, you're going to give them a safe place to practice and fail and learn from it before you even think about getting them to work independently. In English, we very much think about children are taught to be able to, uh, to speak first. Uh, and before they would write a story, you'd expect them to maybe be able to tell you a story. Um, it's very similar in maths. So it's giving them that time to talk to discuss all the way through before you eventually, you might say, okay, we're gonna have another go on the obstacle course by ourselves now. And then that's when you can assess where the children are and, and think about what needs to be put into place to get them even further. So that's just a little analogy, hopefully, that sort of sums up the mastery approach. And I appreciate that depending on your scheme of work and your setting, that might look slightly different for you. So just to be clear, this is completely backed up by um, the Education Endowment Foundation and Ofsted in their recent maths report recognise that differentiation now is different. That doesn't mean there isn't any. Uh, I think when mastery um, was, was introduced, a lot of people felt that different, okay, no differentiation wasn't exactly the same thing, which isn't quite right. We still need to differentiate, but it will look different. And this is just a little, a, a tiny snippet from the Ofsted subject report for maths here, um, which recognize that leaders and teachers overcame the fact that um, some children didn't reach the extra challenge or some children missed things out by setting a minimum expectation. So that's a case of all pupils doing the basic tasks and then that exit point maybe being slightly different. Um, so sequences of learning are the same for the children and actually that's okay 
it's absolutely okay for sometimes the children to all be doing the same thing so long as you know why it's happening and how those children are being extended at their own level it's absolutely fine for everyone to be doing the same thing um of course what goes into it might be different the stage they get at might be different but they're all doing the same okay so differentiation with a the difference then so instead of having differentiated tasks these are things that you might do uh, we're going to talk a little bit about each of these things today so we're going to talk about how important it is to assess prerequisites making sure you know what the children can do before they get to the lesson where possible uh, and that will lead into a little bit about pre-teaching and how we can support children before we come to the lesson uh, and then we're going to talk quite a lot about constructive collaboration how do you make sure that those partners work well together and that it's good for both pair both members of the pair and not just one uh, we'll talk a little bit about maximizing engagement and I'll share a little bit more from the Ofsted report then. Then we'll go on to talk about some different types of questioning you can do to support and extend. And finally, we'll talk a little bit, although we could do a whole new session, a whole other session on it about task design at the end. So let's have a look then. Prerequisites. So this is not to be confused with assessment of what you're about to teach. When you are teaching something new, uh, you absolutely there is value in doing an assessment of what the children currently know on the uh, topic but also it's important to think about what the prerequisite knowledge is so for example I've just taken a little snippet from a year three lesson um, on reasoning about multiplication and feel free to type some ideas into the chat you don't have to but if you've got any ideas that answer the questions we'll do this a couple of times during this se the session um, have a look at that so it's about multiplication and it's asking whether Two statements there are true or false. So I just want you to think about if your child, if that was part of a task that you were expecting your class to complete during a lesson, what do they need to know before they can even access that uh, lesson? Absolutely, yes. It's no good uh, showing children that if they don't know what, well, actually, if they don't know what a multiplication symbol and equal symbols are, but more importantly, maybe for this particular lesson, you would want to check that they understood what a more than um, symbol represented, um, which incidentally is really important that children do know what an equal symbols means. It's all too often where we have a calculation, which is maybe the other way around with the answer at the front children are confused because they um, may have only seen calculations with the equals just before the answer and they take it to mean here comes the answer rather than is equivalent to so it's really important that those symbols are yeah exactly Alicia yeah so making sure that they have an understanding not just being able to name it but to really understand what those symbols mean so Prerequisites are not really necessarily assessing the subject knowledge of the thing you're about to teach, but what do they need to know to be able to access it? Because if you, for example, are expecting a child to complete that task and they don't know what one of those symbols means, you're putting them at a disadvantage and they're not going to be able to um, concentrate their cognition on the new concept. So, I mean, we could go on, we could say, yeah, the equal sign. We could, for, for some children, you can extend that very easily by talking about, well, what if we change the sign to make sure they understand? You could ask children to show that they understand an equal sign by drawing a picture for it. How you assess those prerequisites doesn't have to be in this context, but certainly it's worth checking first that your children are able to access the, the concept that you're going to be teaching. Yeah. Absolutely, Max. I think I think that's there is so much in this one tiny question. We probably could have done a session on it, but it's really picking apart, isn't it, what they need to know. And I think for some uh, teachers, actually, that's quite hard. You have to have very good subject knowledge to be able to do that, which is why planning um, together in a group and discussing before uh, before the lesson is a really, um, really good thing to do. So prerequisites, which will lead us on to slightly differently pre teaching. So I recognise from my own um, time in the classroom that not everybody has the luxury of time or people to deliver a pre-teaching intervention. If you do, it is so powerful to be able to pre-teach, even just as a warm-up to get those children. Imagine we're on the obstacle course. They're just doing a little quick warm-up separately first. So they're really ready to tackle it. And for some children, having a little bit of prior warning can be really powerful for that growth mindset. So if you are lucky enough to be able to carry out a pre-teach 
um, then that's really helpful. And I've just put there um, an example of one of our same day interventions that um, we have available at Twinkle. However, it, it's not an ideal world. And I recognize that time is very, very uh, precious in primary, particularly when you have such a whole um, tapestry of, of lessons to teach. So it could be that you just have to think, at how am I going to support the children in the lesson itself? So for some children, just a vocabulary bank is enough. You know, some children do not necessarily have the capacity to hold in their heads what the meaning of lots of new words are. If you can provide them with a vocabulary bank and preferably with a pictorial representation or actual manipulatives to, to build those things with, then that is really powerful. Um, it's quite a simple thing. Uh, and it's not cheating, you know, you're enabling the child to access the next step of learning. It's probably a good time to mention that, you know, you know the importance of fluency and learning key facts to automaticity. What we sh should hopefully not be doing is using a big bulk of our maths lessons to do that. I know a lot of schools now are doing maths meetings, or arithmetic meetings um, daily to try to address that. Of course, we know that if children have got good recall, then that's going to free up um, some space from cognitive space to learn new things. But if they're not able to do that, providing a vocabulary list, uh, a dictionary, a word mat, anything like that. And that's just one example of our year three one from Twinkle there. Anything like that could be really helpful. And of course, if you have the time, getting the children to create their own maths dictionary that they can refer to is really powerful too. So that's before the lesson making sure we're ready for the obstacle course. You know, you wouldn't expect maybe some children to do obstacle course with, with some inappropriate uh, shoes on. So it's just making sure they're completely ready in the best way you can and using what resources you have. And I appreciate that. We're not lucky enough necessarily to have a pre-teach. If you are, then, then that's great. But if not, there are other things you can do. So it's about scaffolding. What things can you do? Can you prepare before the lesson that are gonna prepare some of those children who maybe find it a little bit more difficult? OK, so a really important one, and one we're probably going to spend a bit, little bit more time talking about is that collaboration. I think the idea of a class working in mixed pairs, and that might be by attainment, it might be by um, communication skills, it could be by a lot. You can mix them in all sorts of ways. Um, sometimes that sort of fills you with dread. But it's really important that you teach the children how to work collaboratively. It could take time and you don't have to necessarily teach collaboration through maths. You could do it in a completely different way. And I know we're in January now, but you, you can always do this. Um, but maybe the beginning of a, of a term is a good time to do it. You might do it in a very creative way. So you might do it through building a spaghetti and marshmallow tower, whatever. But you want the children to learn how to work collaboratively and to know what it means. And this is just some, an example in the white square there, it's some things you might talk about. And again, it's really best if you can do this with the children. Do a collaborative task and then ask them to come up with the things that what, what does good working collaboratively look like? And it's really important that good is in there. It has to be effective. So, Children need to know that they need to listen. And if you are listening, what does that look like? Uh, and of course, we recognize, I mean, there are a lot of people and some of you right now might be doodling or making notes or doing something at the same time. It doesn't mean you're not listening. So it's important to know your class here as well. But what does good listening look like? You need to encourage your children to ask good questions. And I've got some on on later slide to share with you so what do we mean by good questions or how are they going to get the best out of their partner rather than just firing questions at them also and this is a difficult one i think for a teacher thinking time silence is okay and it's okay for your children to know that as well they don't have to feel every every minute um every second it could be that they just need to just sit for a minute and listen and, and think um a little bit of respect in here so acknowledging the views of your partner even if you don't agree, and also talking about what you do if you don't agree. Uh, how do you tackle that? And it could be giving some sentence stems to say, uh, you might say, um, I'm not sure I agree with you. Can you convince me? Something like that. But it's talking about teaching them how to be collaborative. Um, how can they convince somebody in a non-confrontational way? 
not easy lots of adults can't do it but how do you make sure you do it and the way that we make sure that we tool children up to do that is give them the vocabulary so they know how to talk about their maths um and a really good way when you're working collaboratively is to commentate what you're doing um, we do it all the time as teachers when we're modeling you're talking about what you're doing you're thinking out loud it's a really good tool for children to have and it goes without saying that this working collaboratively is not one of those the class is in silent and it's very it's very quiet and you can hear a pin drop times that's for later when they're doing their independent work if you go into a classroom and children are working effectively collaboratively particularly in maths you should be able to feel it in the classroom feel the maths ethos uh, of course this is a perfect time when your class are working collaboratively to observe again it's something that we're not very good at as teachers sometimes because we feel like we should be doing we should be sitting with a group we should be questioning a pair sometimes you can learn an awful lot just by watching and being able to watch different pairs listen to what they're saying and also of course if you're um say you're helicoptering going around the room and you've spotted two pairs maybe that are making the same misconception that might be a good time to bring the class back together talk it through maybe ask one of the pairs to feedback but you can deal with those misconceptions there much more powerful than marking a lot of books at the end of the lesson so when you work collaboratively how you do it might look slightly different and again i don't know what your your individual settings are but hopefully you'll be able to use some of these ideas so first of all when you've taught them how to collaborate and what it is and come up with these lovely this lovely checklist for collaboration uh you're going to want to mix them and how you mix them doesn't mean you go for two extremes in actual fact those probably are not the best pairings you wouldn't go for a child who's really quick grasping at new concepts to someone who's going to really find it hard to do it and have to go quite slowly that might not be an effective pairing however you are the best person to do those pairings and it could take time when my school adopted teaching for mastering we first did it I think it took six weeks before I was happy that my pairings were effective and they didn't stay. They weren't necessarily um, in place after that. They were quite fluid, but it takes a while. You need to find children who are going to work together. And we do also know that there are going to be some children who really, really struggle working collaboratively. There are ways around it. You could uh, be their partner, model for them how it's done, teach them how to do it switch their partners there are lots of ways and the only way the only person that's going to know how to do that is you you are the best best person to do that because you know your children so how can you make sure then you've got your mixed pairs let's say you've got it perfect how are you going to make sure that the children are working collaboratively and it's not just one child doing the work and one person sitting staring out the window or bothering another pair there are lots of ways you can do it and actually it's a conversation to be had um at your school but some these are some of the things that i have seen or, or tried before that work so using a shared whiteboard or a jottings book so there's one book per pair rather than two and the reason why you might go down the book route rather than a whiteboard is that you've got evidence then having said that this is not necessarily something you're going to mark remember this is the safe place the collaborative bit is where it's safe to make mistakes and maybe it not be perfect so it is really more about jottings and more about what's happening at the time rather than what it looks like although a good jottings book could be a good memory jogger when they go on to their independent task if they need it as well so having one shared whiteboard which is in the middle of the children rather than on one side um, is a really good way to make them work together one pencil as well so they're not both trying to do it at the same time although sometimes you might want them to do that uh encourage the children to model and uh, sorry encourage the children to commentate their work again it's something you might need to teach we do it all the time as teachers um what are they doing and why speaking out loud all the time because actually that's a really good way you, you your understanding will deepen if you can explain it uh this was my class's favorite always one speaker one writer so i've done my modeled bit i've talked about the new concept i'm, I'm going to put five on the board for them to have a go at and then one person is going to talk commentate what what's going on and the other person in the pair is going to write and then at any point i would shout out switch and then they swap roles so you can't just have one passive member of the of the partnership they have to both be involved um another one and again i i'm 
I do reiterate that I only do this if you know your class really well and your pairings are sorted. But what I have also done is um, moved partners along as the lesson has gone on. So we started a particular pair and then a number of the children, all the odd children have stood up at one point and moved on to a different partner. Because we're all doing the same thing, all the same content, we could do that. But again, I don't don't suggest you do that until you've really nailed the partnerships. Um, another way to make sure children are working together, make sure you've got vocabulary banks and STEM sentences. Give the children the power to talk about their maths. Let them talk. You know, I know there's lots of questioning. Do the children really need to know quotient, divisor, dividend? If you're talking about maths, you need to be able to do it effectively. So really tool them up, model it, make sure any other adults in your classroom model it, have it on working rules, have it in vocabulary and expect it. There's no reason why you shouldn't expect that children will use the correct language. And then I mentioned these before, give the children some questions that they can use. How do you know? Can you show it in a different way? Is there equipment that could help us? How can we check? And the best one, are you sure? And of course, we know as teachers that we often use, are you sure? Even if children have got it right. And children will learn that, you know, give them um, something on their table or maybe have it in your classroom. These questions could be used for lots of things and it's encouraging that discussion. So they're leading their own learning here and that will both support children who maybe aren't so sure because they can ask for clarification. Are you sure? How do you know? Can you show me? But also for children who are maybe quicker to grasp new concepts by showing it in a different way, by showing it with equipment, by explaining it is going to deepen their understanding. It's not about one child helping another child, which is why this is the time when this happens. It's not a case of we're going to do the work and then when you're finished, you can go and help that table. It's happening at the time. The children are a team, they're working together and everyone can bring something to that partnership. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be maths related, but everybody can bring something. And you will often find that children who are slower to grasp things are actually better at explaining it because they've had to take the time to process it. So some questions there that you can use in your classroom um, to, to help the children to work collaboratively. And again, it does need to be taught. It's not intrinsic necessarily, but it will help you in everything, not just maths. So definitely worth something uh, spending time spend, spend, spending time on it. Okay, I just a little one I put in because I felt like this was this is really interesting. If you haven't had a chance, and I, I know we're all very busy to have a look at the maths subject report from Ofsted from last year, there were lots of things in there that they let you know was okay to do. And we already mentioned the fact that it's okay for children to be doing the same task. It's okay for that to happen sometimes, and it's needed as long as that you can explain why. So I will let you read that yourself. I won't read it to you, but ping pong approach, that's that back and forth. You have a go, let them have a go. You have a go, let them have a go. Bring them back together to talk about a misconception, let them carry on. Partner work, small steps of progress of teachers circulating, all of those things that we just talked about, they are all backed up by Ofsted, which I think sometimes it's nice to hear that, isn't it? You know that that's what people are looking for. And also, and this is one of my favourites, um, lots of choral response with the whole class. I say, you, we say, you say, that sort of thing. And songs and rhymes, you know, it's taking away the fear. You can use it and you can use it all the way through primary. It's not just something for younger children. Um, times tables, games, songs, anything that's going to help to remember important knowledge. And that's going to be fun. You know, it's supposed to be enjoyable. You want children, you want to instill a love of maths, whether that comes easily or not. That's what you want. You want all the children to succeed. You want the culture to be that maths is great and maths is celebrated. It can be really hard when you've got maybe parents and parents even saying, I can never do maths, I can't do it. Or you've got adults in school who maybe haven't got the confidence or a little bit, oh, I couldn't, I can't do it, I can't. We need to try and change that mindset. And actually that's that's a good lesson for everything, not just maths, but certainly, you know, use those songs. And I've got put a few twinkle examples there, but there's a plethora of wonderfully fun ways to practice maths as well. And choral response, children quite like it. And it's and it's you can see if a child makes a mistake that they don't feel like they're on their own. So it just takes away that fear factor a little bit and that maths anxiety, which can be a real barrier. 
Okay, so we've talked collaboration and engagement. We're going to talk a little bit about questioning. So I'm going to ask you a question as well in a minute. Uh, so questioning it needs to be planned for, but can also be um, you, as, as a when. So we're going to talk about both. So this slide is about questions which are specific to your task. So these are things that you might have on your planning, for example. Uh, the idea is that questions should stimulate discussion and encourage pattern spotting. And then I've just put a little reminder in that box there that Ofsted recommended that questioning helps pupils to recall and make connections. You're not just asking random questions. What we're not doing is saying, can you write me, a, can you write me three more questions? Think about the questions you're asking and why you're asking them, which is why this is a good thing to add to your planning. Um, what do you want children to notice? How can you guide them in the right direction? Particularly those children who are quick to grasp new concepts, you really want to challenge them to find things. So if you've got a list of questions, you might say, you know, what do you notice about these questions in particular? Of course, you will know what the answer is and you will know what you're trying to lead them to. But they might come up with other things as well. Why was this question different? What would happen if you made the numbers 10 times bigger? Can you represent this question using a number line? All things that you can just add to your planning um, and have with you so that you can ask those questions as and when. If you're um, patrolling the class when they're doing collaboration, you've got those ready. You've planned for them. OK, if children are doing it too quickly, this is how I can extend them. You've got them there. So I've just included, this is just a tiny snip from a year two question about comparing lengths using inequality. So to think about, and if you want to, you can put stuff, uh, some answers in the chat. Uh, how could you use questioning to alter and extend this task? So you've got three questions there. Let's imagine you've done a bit of modeling and you're going to now say, okay, I want you to have a go, pass it on to the partners. You're going around and there's a partner, they've whisked through it. How could you extend that task using questioning? Have you got any ideas? Maybe you could look at the examples I've put at the top. So let's have a look then. So I might say, okay, what if, uh, could you put those questions in, in order for me? Which was the easiest question and which was the hardest? And more importantly, why? Which one was the harder one and why? Uh, can you prove to me that the top one is correct using only pictures? Don't don't fall into the trap of thinking that asking children to represent things uh, things using a number line or a picture means that they're going backwards. It's just a great way to show deeper understanding. It doesn't have to be um, a support mechanism. Uh, you might say, okay, well, okay, let's have a look at that middle one. How many answers can I find to that? To that calculation what's the smallest number i could put in what's the largest number i could put in there are endless ways that you can add questioning but it does depend on your children and it depends on the group so and and again i know the time is so precious and it's not that easy to sit and look at your planning and annotate it with some questions but just one or two so you've got something so that when you're going around uh your class and you're spotting that children are getting somewhere how do you use a question to make sure that they're all getting as far as they as they can? OK, so that's task specific questions. Slightly easier because you can think about them in advance, but you do need the time to be able to do that in the first place as well. So thinking about look at the task. How can you extend it? What questions could you ask? What do you want the children to find? If you were looking at that top one, you might say, OK, what if I made uh, all of the num both of the numbers that are given 10 centimetres smaller? Would that affect your answers? What about if I made them 10 times smaller? Don't forget, you will know your range of children, so you will know the sorts of questions you can ask them to alter the task. Uh, the other thing, of course, you could do for support is, is you could have a range that you give to the children rather than having it completely open-ended. The other sort of questioning uh, are more general questions. And these are the ones where you have to be quite confident that you um, are able to just pull them out of your head as when they're needed. Um, the resource that I have shared at the bottom there is a resource that came out of the last um, Teach Me for Mastery. And it's some lanyards with these questions on. Having them to hand is a really um, 
good way to make sure you can draw upon them all the time. So these are ones that could be applied to anything, not just to one particular lesson. So you're using them on the hoof all the time. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about each of those. So uh, put the questions in order of how easy and hard you found them. I mentioned that one a second ago. So that can be quite tricky. And the important thing, of course, is not putting them in the order, but it's being able to explain why. Why was that one harder? For example, you might be looking at um, adding through boundaries and maybe um, the last question goes through the boundary. Children need to explain why maybe that was, what, was a bit trickier. Or maybe you will have questions represented in different ways and you might ask them which one was easier, which one was harder. Uh, this is a good one for children who are really sure of themselves. Uh, try to convince your partner that one of your answers, one of their answers is wrong, even if you don't believe it. So again, you need to be careful with this because you don't want to confuse children. But for some children, trying to convince them that they are incorrect can be really powerful, be not because of what you're saying, but because of what they're saying back to you. Uh, we talked a little bit briefly about are you sure before? Don't just use it when children are wrong, use it when they're right as well. Make sure they're always sure. Um, I was lucky enough to watch a Singaporean lesson and children automatically at the end of a task did it in two different ways. Um, they didn't wait to be asked, they just it was just an automatic. They, they had just knew that that was their way to show their understanding. So use are you sure all the time, not just when you want them to, to check because they've made a mistake. Um, you might ask children to find all possibilities. That would uh, work with the question we looked at on the previous side. Uh, slide and then convince me how do you know you found them all how do you know uh just saying because i have isn't going to be enough you really need to teach them and if they can't do that do it for them model for them maybe give them a sentence stem to help them uh what's the same about the questions and what's different and is there an odd one out always a good one for if you don't want a specific answer uh, odd one out is tricky isn't it because we can say is there an odd one out but as long as you can back up your reasons for something being an odd one out, there's not necessarily one correct answer. So that's a really good one to generate lots of discussion. Uh, you could also say, you know, is there an odd one out? What do you think? What did your partner think? Do you agree? Can you agree? Can you come up on your preferred answer as which one's the odd one out and explain why? Uh, this is a, a good one for understanding. Is there another way and another and another? And if you've got three different ways, which is the most efficient and why? Um, we often find some children, particularly those who are very, very efficient at written methods, will not want to show a different way um, because they know they're right and they're very accurate and they won't want to do it. However, you need to encourage them to show a different way and also to think about, OK, well, what sort of problem wouldn't that work for? When might it be better to use a number line? We know, well, I experienced lots um, in the mental maths uh, test when children would automatically go to a written method. They've only got a very short amount of time, but they're so accurate, they could do it really quickly in that time. And, and it's, and it, you know, they get the right answer. But actually, if you're, only, if you're subtracting 1,997, there's a much more efficient way of doing it. So it's not just talking about different ways, but when might you use different ways um, and that comes along with the next one as well. Uh, always, sometimes or never true is a mastery classic. Really, really good way to check understanding. Um, it's something always true. Really encouraging children to provide proof, which they have to do at the end of um, Key Stage 2 SATs, but also through their maths education into GCSEs, it's really important, a really good skill. Um, writing a set of steps for how to solve this problem. And you can use them, couldn't you? You could ask them to create something which they can then refer back to. Earlier on, we mentioned creating their own maths dictionaries and things. So there might be something they can do there. And this is an interesting one because earlier on, I mentioned how you don't want to just say to the children, could you write me an extra question? But you could ask them to write two more and ask what was different from those two than the ones that were there already. So it's okay for children to write their own questions, but you need to try to guide them a little bit on what you want the content of those questions to be. Otherwise, it, it can lose its mass focus a little bit and just be a bit of a time filler. So questioning, finally then with questioning, and this is really important is the power of what if you will do it anyway teachers do it automatically but what if questions are a really easy way to adapt a task to provide support 
or to survive challenge. So we've got there a calculation, 74 multiplied by two equals 148. And I've put underneath some questions, some what if questions that might extend some understanding. What if the multiplicand is 10 times bigger? Of course, you would hope that the children you are using this question with would know the word multiplicand, but it's another reason of making sure they know their vocabulary. What if we double the multiplier? What if we divide the multiplier by 10? What if we could only use odd numbers to represent this problem? Things like that. Children who can quickly work out answers love that sort of thing. Things that really get them to think, OK, how am I only going to use odd numbers when all of those are even numbers? Um, or what if we wanted the product to be halved? What would we have to do to the, to the previous numbers? OK, I've put, uh, uh, if you're still with me, I've put uh, another example there. It's a little snip from a ratio question from one of our Diving Into Mastery resources. In the bag, there are two blue marbles for every four green marbles. And then there's a couple of questions there that the children are going to answer. So over to you, if you can think, if your brains are still in gear at this time of day, what what if questions can you think of that might deepen the understanding of that question? No ideas? Uh, okay, what if we doubled all the marbles? Would it affect the ratio? What if we halved all the marbles? Would it affect the ratio? Um, what if we added a red marble? Yeah, what if we changed the total number of marbles? Brilliant, yeah. What if we changed the number? What if we changed the colour? What if we added a new colour? Brilliant, this is perfect. Uh, so that's the sort of thing that you need to encourage happening. and. You can create these what if questions, absolutely. But wouldn't it be powerful if the children did it? What if you what if the children were coming up with what if questions? I love that one, Maria. What if the number of marbles was a multiple of four? Brilliant. And you will find that quite quickly some children will really get involved with this. And, and it's never ending. That's the good thing about it. You're not going to, it's not doesn't have a finite ending. You can really explore some things there. You could take Maria's question, what if the number of marbles is a multiple of three? Does it make any difference? Yeah, Jade, what if you lost some marbles? Um, does it make a difference if the marbles were a different colour? Well, we know it doesn't, but we want the children to be able to answer that. Um, what if we didn't have the bar model to show the colours? Can we show it in a different way? What if we had to give half the marbles away and so on you've got the idea thank you thank you for those questions thank you for taking part today um yeah it is it is a, a nice way to quickly um extend understanding the power of what if and definitely extra powerful if you can teach your children to do it as well and i promise you can um give them the power to extend their own understanding OK, so finally, and I, I alluded at the beginning to the fact that actually I could do a whole session on this and maybe will. Um, but task design is really important because you've done all this fabulous work. You've worked collaboratively. Your children have uh, commentated their work. They've made their way through the obstacle course, helping each other, supporting each other, challenging each other. You've heard, you've observed, you know what language they're using. It's great. And then there has to become a, ta a time, of course, when they need to do something independently and that might be when the feeling changes a little bit you're still keeping that positive maths ethos but um that's where they might work in silence because you they are working independently and support here might look like ha them having access to their jottings book so they can see what they did with their partner when they were safe and there wasn't such a risk of failure it might be uh, that you challenge by the task design itself so uh, back to the Ofsted report, then the all important report, they said in some schools, reasoning and problem solving were an activity or task and something that pupils could choose. This approach may result in some pupils skipping ahead of vital practice of facts and methods or sticking with repeated practice of already secured knowledge. This is problematic because pupils are entitled to learn all types of knowledge. It can be tempting, can't it? If you're tasked with um, thinking about our diving into mastery resources, we start with fluency and we work our way through to some quite com complex problem solving. You want all the children to show you the evidence of fluency. You don't want some people, children to miss it out. 
I mean, if they're if they are very quick to grasp new concepts, they might need varied fluency, and that's where the task design will come in. You will have to think about very clever procedural uh, and conceptual variation, and again, that's a whole um, whole other session. But there is a little bit about it in the other session. But thinking about making sure everybody has access to that reasoning and problem solving. Of course, if you go back and look at the things we've already talked about this evening, reasoning and problem solving is throughout. You know, all of those what ifs, that's reasoning. Uh, they're problem solving, should be problem solving and reasoning all the time. Reasoning isn't a task that's stuck in on a different colour piece of paper or with a reasoning title or with a particular icon on it. Reasoning should be happening throughout. And if you teach children to reason um, with each other uh, through speaking, then their reasoning will come. Um, you know, we know about the discrepancies between scores and arithmetic tests and reasoning tests at the end of key stage two. They should be taught hand in hand. And it certainly isn't a case of some children will only do fluency questions. You just have to scaffold that reasoning and problem solving for some children in a different way. So it's making sure, and it's rec been recognised by Ofsted, that all children are having access to all of the different types of task and not just either getting stuck and not getting to the problem solving or missing out the fluency. It needs to be a balance of both. Uh, so a couple more about task design then. So mastery is about keeping up, not catching up. So you're teaching to the children who may find it slower and you're going at their pace. So it's important that we make sure we're providing challenge for the other children at the same time. But for some children, you can support them. And this is not an exhausting list. And feel free to put some more in the chat if you want to. But this is just some ideas of how you can support children through task design, even when that task is quite complicated or quite problem based, uh, providing access to concrete materials and pictorial representations, of course, they're only useful if the children know what they are. So it's important that they're taught properly as well and effectively. Um, adapting tasks can happen as long as you're not losing the procedural variation, as long as you're not losing one of those obstacles. You know, if you take one of those obstacles out, they haven't got the stepping stone to the next one. Uh, one of the things you might do to adapt is you might, instead of having a sheet of um, problems you might have them separately so they're just looking at one at a time rather than looking at the whole lot some children find that quite difficult and quite overwhelming um a predetermined finish or exit point yeah it could be that you say actually not everybody's going to get to the end of the obstacle course but everybody does need to get to this point because you need to uh, maria that's a really good question i'll come back to that in a second um you want all the children mastery isn't about a certain proportion of your class you want the idea is that we want all the children to master the curriculum. Some of them will have mastery at greater depth, but we want mastery to be something that everybody does. Uh, so Maria, I think teaching to the top is, you could say that it's slightly at odds with teaching for mastery because it, it's quite a traditional way of teaching to the top and getting everybody else up there. Um, certainly the mastery approach is more about making sure that everybody keeps up, but you, have to have a very careful check on those uh the children you've described at the top i think probably again it's difficult using that language but when you say teaching to the top who are we saying who are we teaching to what do we mean by top there are we talking about children who grasp things faster because that doesn't necessarily mean their understanding is there and that is where mastery came from so it's it's about making sure that everybody's coming along and that you're providing that extension for those children. Very difficult question to answer. I hope I've done a little, I've gone a little way to answering that for you. Um, the, another thing you can do, provide structures for children if they need it. Think about what you're actually teaching and what you want them to do and what you can put in place for them. Breaking problems into smaller steps or having prompts at each step. Uh, word banks and stem sentences we've talked about. Uh, it could be that you might partially complete some problems um, so that children don't have to do quite as much in one task and providing additional worked examples is another really good way. Of course, you're going to do that naturally in your teaching anyway, but um, having those jottings books might be another way of doing that as well. So that's for the support as you know, if we're teaching so that everybody can keep up, those children are going to be OK. They're going to come along with us. 
but um, as Maria has has sort of said in that question, the importance we can't forget. There's some children that are going to be very fast graspers, uh, really good recall, maybe fantastic at explaining their work, and they are going to need to be able to show greater depth as well. Don't make assumptions about what your children can do. Um, I have done some GCSE maths work with some children recently, and it you can see from GCSE questions, things that children have learned from key stage one, key stage two. It's so important that there is understanding there for maths, for the good of maths, not for a SATS result, but for the good of maths understanding. So don't make any assumptions. Make sure that everybody has the opportunity to start at the beginning, even if that's just to show that they can do it, or show that they can do it in a different way, or show they can do it in three different ways. Uh, Tom Gary, it, he's in his book, Mastery in Primary Mathematics, said that depth is the ability to answer questions which are not standard in style, which require the application of mathematical thinking as well as mathematical processes, which may require to pulling together knowledge of multiple mathematical domains and which require a clear grasp of the underlying mathematical concepts to solve them successfully. And I have colour coded and broken down a couple of those points there um, just to show different ways that you can extend without uh, driving the content up to a point where lots of children can't access it. So you might think about non-routine problems. Um, so uh, again, I could do a whole other session on, on uh, making non-routine problems, but certainly there's something that you can do there, thinking about why children are, are using a particular way and why, and thinking about not just calculations. Patterns are the all important thing in maths. So it's teaching children about generalizing, working systematically, spotting patterns, all those wonderful problem solving strategies that do need to be taught. Um, we can't assume that children know how to do them. I think, yeah, that's my last slide. Okay, good timing. Okay, so we have covered an awful lot in that session. There's a lot there to think about. And for, for you guys, hopefully you'll be able to think about couple of things that you might be able to take away uh, and use and apply to your setting so if you don't mind and you don't mind sharing one thing maybe that you might take away from the session today something which you might try instantly in your classroom tomorrow or something which you might take back to your senior leadership team then that will be much appreciated it'd be interesting to see what people think of the easy takeaways here uh, you will of course get a copy of the slide so you can look at it at your leisure and maybe share it with some other members of your uh, teaching team as well.